This episode of the Productivity is Podcast is brought to you by Care Of. Care Of is a monthly subscription vitamin service that delivers completely personalized vitamin and supplement packs right to your door. You're going to have the opportunity to save 50% off your first month of personalized Care Of vitamins. And I'll share how you can do that during this episode. But for now, let's get on with the show. Welcome to the Productivity Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Barty, and I am really excited to bring the guest for this episode to you today. It's Austin Cleon. I've been following Austin's work for a long time, from Steal Like an Artist to Show Your Work to his new book, Keep Going. And, uh, you know, uh, we talk about how we were able to connect. We talk about, you know, just a lot of the stuff that he has spoken about in his new book that is so related to productivity and time management. And you wouldn't think about that necessarily on its face when it comes to his work as, you know, a creative writer and artist. Um, But there are some real valuable things that you can take out of this episode. And I just want to get right to it. So here's my conversation with bestselling uh, author and uh, just uh, one of the guys I've been following for a long time. And I'm so excited to bring him to you today. Here's my conversation with Austin Cleon here on the Productivity Just Podcast. I'd like to welcome Austin Cleon to the Productivity is Podcast. Thanks so much for joining me, Austin. It's been it's been uh, something that I've been wanting to do for quite some time. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So you've got a new book coming out, uh, and actually, as of as of now, it's it's pretty much out in the wild. It's uh, Keep Going: Ten Ways to Stay Creative in Good Times and Bad. This seems to be the book that creatives need right about now. I I hope so. I mean, I I think everybody needs it. I needed it. I mean, that's why I wrote it. It's it's a funny thing because I, you know, my other books were written for other people. Like Steal Like an Artist was written for like a a younger, dumber version of myself. Um, Show Your Work was written for my audience who kind of kept asking me all these questions about self-promotion. Um, and this book was the first book that I wrote because I needed to read it myself. Um, and so it sort of is a departure <laughs> in that sense, um, you know, and I, and I think like a lot of people, uh, particularly in the States, uh, we kind of, you know, you keep, we just keep waking up every morning and it seems like things have gotten dumber and meaner overnight. And to add to that, I think every creative person I know is kind of hitting up against the wall of realizing that like a creative work doesn't necessarily ever get any easier, you know, that it's always kind of a struggle to constantly reinvent and, and come up with new ideas. And so I wanted to write a book about how to have a more long-term approach to this stuff and to simply pull yourself through the days. Well, one of the things that you talk about right out of the gate in the book, and this is something that I know will appeal to the productivity folks that are listening is the idea of, because there's so much um, kind of chaos may not be the right word. I'm going to use it anyways. In the day-to-day <laughs> life, the importance of having routinization and being and having routines. You talk about like a daily routine. What does yours look like? And why do you think that having a daily routine, maybe not just even a morning routine, but something that is consistent throughout the day or even just a morning and evening routine is so important? That's a great, great question. Um, I personally think that I think creative work is like, um, I think it's like a, it's, it's a verb. It's like an activity. It's like, uh, it's, it's like you're an athlete or something, you know, I think it's, uh, I think it's Haruki Murakami who's written about how much training to run helps him write novels. But I think that, you know, creative work is about getting in there every day and and having a daily practice. And I think routine is the thing that really makes sure that you do that practice every day. Um, If I had to describe my routine, I'd probably borrow uh, John Waters um, quip that he uh, thinks things up in the morning and he sells them in the afternoon. (laughs) So the morning is kind of my creative time. Like I, I get up with our kids who are super young. Um, I have a six year old and a four year old, uh, boys and we get up in the morning and we have breakfast and we kind of putter around and then my wife will get up and I'll get her coffee and 
breakfast and then I'll come up and I'll write for a couple hours. Um, and then we have lunch together and I get my kid on the school bus and then I come upstairs and I do all the things that kind of the, the more admin based stuff, you know, I'll answer emails, I'll do a podcast like we're doing now. Uh, you know, I'll do the kind of more business end stuff. And there's something about having that routine. Um, and I keep fairly nine to five hours, I would say like, just like a banker, basically bankers hours. Um, and I, I think for me, there's something about the morning that's more, more, uh, I've always been kind of a morning person and that's where I try to, you know, cram all my creative work into. And then the afternoon I've always thought is this weird mongrel time as Dickens called it, where <laughs> I don't know that many people who are afternoon people. So I kind of, um, uh, you know, this is the time where I like to take calls and stuff like that. And then in the evening, uh, I just try to unplug and hang out with my family and then I read a bunch. So that's pretty much like generally what the day looks like. And then there's always a walk in there somewhere. I walk with my wife every day. We take about a three or four mile walk. So one of the things that you bring up in the book is uh, the idea of having uh, a place, like a place where you can go and kind of do the creative work. And I think that um, I've talked about this a little bit before, about having like productivity zones in my office where like certain work happens in certain places. And I've seen your, I mean, you, you have, you make no, uh, make no bones about sharing that uh, both, you know, on your blog, as well as you know, in the book. Um, how did you, how did you come to the, the decision of what your, uh, you call it a bliss station looks like, but also, um, how has it evolved and does it continue to evolve? So yeah, the bliss station idea is something I stole from Joseph Campbell and his idea that you had to have a place or a certain hour of the day where you kind of felt safe and secure and you could kind of access, you know, your more creative side. Um, and the thing that I'm always really, zoomed in on with that is that he says there's a place or a time. And so I think sometimes for some of us, you know, if you're a, if you're a mom with young children, you might not have a place because you're in this like crammed house or whatever, but you might have a time, you know? So like you might be able to take nap time or the few hours before your kids get up or at night or something like that. So I think sometimes, you know, the Cadillac treatment would be, you know, the really luxurious thing would to be have a place and a time. But I think if you don't have time, a place will help a lot. You know, like if you just need to squeeze things in, uh, a dedicated place helps. And then I think if you don't have a place, then time can be your friend. Um, and so, but I think that there's something about when you do that daily practice or you kind of do that thing that gets you in the mode every day, it helps to return to a place to be regular about it or to do it at a certain time. And there's something about the repetition. I think that it's, it's ritualized, you know, it's like a, when you sit down at a desk, you know, okay, it's time for this work. And, um, I actually have two, you know, you mentioned different zones for doing different kinds of work. I actually have an analog desk and I have a digital desk in my office. And so right now I'm at the digital desk because I'm, you know, I'm talking to you and we're on Skype and doing that kind of thing. And then um, my analog desk doesn't have anything electronic on it. It's just paper and pencils and notebooks and stuff. And I have a set time for to go there, you know, in the morning and try to let the ideas happen. And once the ideas happen, I'll pop over to the digital desk and like write about them for a while or I'll, you know, blog something or share online. And a lot of my day is a kind of dance between those two desks. One of the things that I think it was John Cleese that said that in order to be truly creative, you need time and space. You can't have one and expect to put your great creative work out there. And same thing with the other. So if you have too much time and not enough space, you feel cramped, you feel constrained. And if you have too much space, but not enough 
not enough time, you feel hurried. And I think that one of the things people get caught up in, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, is just the pace of the world and the pace of the day. How do you combat that? Because, I mean, yes, when you get into your own space and you have your own things going on, and I, I know you mentioned the book about the idea of, uh, and I don't do this either, waking up and jumping onto any of these, you know, myriad of news sites to learn about what's going yeah. on in the world is <laughs> not exactly the best way to start your day. But how do you combat like this, this speed of life and, and this idea that um, it's go, go, go fast, fast, fast now, now, now. And it, in a world where you're trying to really put forth your best possible creative work. It's a constant struggle. You know, I mean, it's nothing that I have completely figured out. Um, and I'm just as, lost some days as other people. But I I do know that, you know, what I know for sure is that creativity is definitely about connection in in that you have to be connected to the world in order to be influenced and inspired by it and to have something to say about it. But then you also have to disconnect from the world long enough to discover what it is that you actually have to say about it or what your work is. Um, And so it's really this dance between connection and disconnection that that makes the work and that is actually part of the work. And um, for me, it's just being connected is easy. I mean, you know, I'm connected all day long. We all are. I mean, I've got my phone in front of me, you know, too often. Um, But the trick is disconnecting. Um, and I just think the easiest way to disconnect is to not connect in the first place. So I just, that's why I love the morning so much. I mean, I really try not to check email or get on Twitter or Instagram or any of that stuff in the morning. I fail a lot, you know, but, um, uh, I just try to schedule and this is where like the routine comes in. I just try to schedule disconnection time, you know, where no one can find me and, and I'm just in the zone. You know, but it's difficult and it's particularly difficult with children and, and particularly when you're at home with children, because, you know, interruption is the sole fact of your life as a parent. <laughs> so <laughs> I've got uh, it's 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 spring break here right now as we're recording wow. this. So both of my kids are at home. I've got a 14 year old and an eight year old. <laughs> so they have a bit more um, self-management control. <laughs> I think yours probably yes. too after. And actually, here's an interesting thing that, that I want to talk about boundaries because I think that, that you've, ta- you've just touched on that, the idea of having these boundaries and these constraints because I think they're needed. Um, one of the things that I've done is, and I did this for years because I've been working home for years, is I got like a, a simple, you know, like the hotel do not disturb signs that you hang outside your door, right? Oh, and yeah. So all I yeah. did was was I have, and it's the only, like I have it outside my door and if my door is open, come on in. If my door is shut, please knock first and then I'll respond. If the door is shut with the door knocker on it, don't even, don't even. In fact, what's funny is my son to this day, and this has been like five years in the making, he assumes that I'm I'm doing a podcast if there is a sign on the door. Like <laughs> even though I might be doing a coaching call or something else like that, or I might not be right. doing anything at all um, in terms of meeting with someone. I've just, there's this boundary that's been created. How, how important for you are setting up like just simple boundaries that you can adhere to and then again, making sure that you respect them so that others do as well. Oh man, so important and so hard. Uh, they're just so young right now that it, they just don't really understand that, you know, what do you mean dad has to go work? You know, it's funny cause my, uh, my kids just think that like, they don't really understand that people go to jobs. Like they're so, they're, idea of what work is is so bizarrely twisted like um and it's funny because my father-in-law is a great writer but he writes for a newspaper so he has to go to like to the office every day and we were staying with them for a while and he would get dressed and like ready for work and my kids would just be like what do you mean grandpa grandpa's go- where is he going why is he dressed up <laughs> yeah. and so they just don't really understand work and and i and I'm pretty fluid right now as far as like whether we're playing or we're working. Like I had Owen, my oldest, in the studio with me today just because he was being such a pain to his mom. And uh, and we were just like working together. And um, I don't know. Boundaries are weird right now because um, I just don't have that many. Um, but like, you know, today I'm I've done exactly what you do, which is like the doors 
closed if not locked and there's a sign <laughs> a do not disturb sign and you know everybody knows what's going on so um but i think that uh you know it's you the biggest thing that i think about boundaries is something that my wife said and she and she said if you never go to work you never get to leave work and so that is particularly helpful, I think, for people who work at home, which is if you're never in dedicated work mode, then you never get out of work mode. You know, it's just kind of this like – so I think that's why for me like the hours are so helpful to just like, no, I keep banker's hours. Like I don't check email after dinner you know, or like I don't jump on the computer first thing in the morning. You know, to have those boundaries of I, I think that's actually a Cleese thing. He says boundaries of time and boundaries of space, you know, and to have those boundaries is is essential, I think. Well, and I think one of the things that you talk about in the book, and this is this is not necessarily new, go figure, from the guy who wrote Steel Like an Artist, um, is the idea right. of yes, you're and I'm a creative too, so I get this like you see th- Things, whatever you're looking at, whenever you're out in the world, you will see things and it could inspire you. So you talk, you know, the idea of having a notebook with you or a phone with you, I think that still allows you to kind of um, foster that creative side of you without necessarily breaking a boundary, right? Like you quickly take a picture, you kind of know what that means, or you'll revisit it later. And we'll talk a bit more about like, you know, the mess and, 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 and all that stuff a little bit later. But I think that that element needs to be there too, because then it's got some, you've got some flexibility built into it so that you're not feeling, Hey, okay, it's it, the, I've punched the clock. It's done. I've got to shut off my creative brain because let's face it, it doesn't shut off. Yeah. I mean, that's, you never, I mean, I think that is the big trade off, uh, with a, with a life of creative work is it's just, you know, you're, you're just never off really. I mean, you're never completely done with it and you're never completely unplugged. I mean, I, that's something that my wife is just such a great kind of gauge for this for me is whenever I'm feeling extremely lazy or like I haven't done a lot lately. I mean, she just reminds me all the time that like, you know, you're just never off. Like you're always, you know, you've always got your notebook in your pocket. (laughs) I mean, you're, you're never off. So, but I, but I do think that, um, just because your mind isn't off doesn't mean that you need input from others. You know, I think that's the, that's the real thing is to not be pulled by any, anyone to, to do your own kind of, to be doing your own pulling at a certain point. You know, I, I, I feel like during the day, you know, the minute you open Twitter or you open the email, someone can pull your mind in another direction that you might not want it to be pulled, you know? And so it's more of like a freedom thing, even though you're always on and your brain's always on, like it's more about the freedom of pointing your attention in the direction you want it to go rather than having it scattered. Meal planning is important because it prevents us from being a disappointed wreck when dinner time comes around and we have no clue what to make or even if we have the ingredients to make the meal. It's a time and a money saver, but most importantly, it frees up valuable brain space. Creating a meal plan prepares us for the week to come and gives us peace of mind that we're organized and can feed ourselves and our family. That's why I do it and that's why Plan to Eat helps me do it. Your subscription includes access to the Plan to Eat website and fully featured mobile apps on iOS and Android. And Plan to Eat gives you the tools to clip and organize recipes from any website, the ones your family loves and that fit your dietary preferences and needs. And you can create a meal plan around your schedule. Then what happens is the Plan to Eat software automatically creates an organized shopping list based on your plan. So sign up for your free trial at plantoeat.com slash timecrafting. That's plantoeat.com forward slash timecrafting. The coupon will be automatically applied to your account and can be used when you're ready to subscribe. It's valid for new customers only. Give Plan to Eat a try today. Okay, we're going to take a break from the proceedings to talk about our sponsor for this episode, Care Of. Now, spring is a great time of year to get back into a healthy routine. And now that the winter blues have come to an end, it's finally time to get back into a routine. And you know how big I am on routines that will empower you to feel your healthiest. I know I'm doing that now. I'm in my season of betterment right now. And Care Of is that monthly subscription vitamin service 
that's going to deliver you those completely personalized vitamin and supplement packs right to your door. It's convenient, it's efficient, and it's just going to make you better. Care of's online quiz lets you know exactly what you need. I took the quiz and it really distilled down what I was going to need. It's it's fun. It's It asks you about your diet, which I know I've improved upon, but health goals as well, lifestyle choices. And it only takes five minutes to find out your personal scientifically backed vitamin and supplement recommendations. Now, it can be really hard to know what vitamins or supplements you should be taking. You know, the research involved, all that stuff, you don't have time for that. But Care of makes it easy to find out what you specifically need to be your healthiest. Getting your vitamins should be easy and convenient and Care of happens to let you do that. It delivers daily vitamin and supplement packs customized to your recommendations to promote personal health and wellness right to your door. And your personalized Care of subscription box gets sent right to your door every month, every month. So you get personalized daily packs, which is great for people like you who are busy and on the go. And again, there's a a big difference that you can experience with Care of. A portion of every sale goes towards the Good Plus Foundation, which provides expectant mothers in need with valuable prenatal vitamins. So if you can take care of yourself and take care of others along the way, What's not to like about that? And vegan and vegetarian supplement options are available to match your dietary needs. Now, you want to get 50% off your first month of personalized care of vitamins. I'm going to help you do that. Just go to takecareof.com and enter the promo code TIMECRAFTING50. So again, you can get 50% off your first month of personalized care of vitamins. It's huge. You just need to go to takecareof.com and enter the promo code TIMECRAFTING50 to make that happen. I'd like to thank Care Of for sponsoring this episode of the Productivities Podcast. Now let's get back to the show. See, I'm a big believer that productivity isn't about, you know, speed and efficiency and all that. I believe it's, you know, a marriage of intention and attention. And I think after reading your work for a number of years that, I mean, and again, going through, keep going, that seems to be a really prevalent message in there. It's like, you know, where, where your attention goes, and, and this, this comes up. Uh, in the book, actually, the idea of attention. Why, how, how do we, how do you help or how do we get more people to realize that like as much as time moves on, and again, you touch on this later in the book as well, to think things in terms of attention more necessarily than let's say the passage of time. Yeah. I mean, I think attention can alter time. I mean, we, we know what that, you know, and, and I think you can just do like some simple experiments to kind of prove that. I mean, everyone's had that kind of relative relativity experience where you're completely immersed in something and the hours just fly by, you know, versus like watching the clock tick. Um, and, and that's just like one example, but to really get people to understand that your life is really what you pay attention to, that like that is exactly what life is made of is just a really hard step. And it's hard to, particularly in writing um, and talking to writers, trying to get them to understand that like your work is made up of what you pay attention to. And it's, and then you, the way that you kind of discover what it is that you have to say is that you pay attention to what you pay attention to (laughs) as Amy Krauss Rosenthal said, the late great Amy, um, and she's in the book. And I I just love that, you know, paying attention to what you pay attention to. It's, it's, it's kind of a, it's a line that, that has two meanings. One, it's a caution, you know, it's a cautionary thing. Like, well, just pay attention to what you pay attention to because what you pay attention to is your, is your life. And then the other side of it is, the way to figure out what your life is and what you're up to is to pay attention to what you've been paying attention to, you know? So I, in a very concrete way, like a lot of people talk about writing a diary and the, and the, um, kind of the, a lot of people talk about diaries in terms of the therapeutic now. And like, you know, a lot of people write diaries cause it makes them feel good in the moment or, or they're getting something off their chest or it's, therapeutic at the time and then they never go back through their diaries but i'm one of those people i don't maybe i'm strange but i find that rereading your diaries is a matter of orientation it really shows you where you've been 
and in what direction you've been headed. And um, maybe it's just because my memory for what happens to me is so terrible. But um, when I go back through my notebooks, it's a it's a matter of like pattern recognition. Like I can really figure out, uh, you know, what it is that I'm actually trying to get at here this week. You know, like what's been what's been preoccupying me, and and I just find so many clues by going back through my notebooks that um that pay attention to what you pay attention to is just like a really powerful thing well if you're strange then i'm strange because i do the same thing i go back <laughs> <Yeah>. and look. <laughs> i actually make a point of uh, i actually have and this is where i think you talked about like the idea of having a a, a a memory that needs you know remember like almost like a reminder of what happened because i tend to use uh because i capture so much that i now have become this person that relies on the capture habit more than the retention habit because my journaling Uh and where i put it ends up becoming the thing that i can go back and reflect upon and and then you can course correct i'm not a guy who necessarily does what you know the traditional quote (coughs) weekly review or anything like that i'll go back and look at it's kind of like the star like star trek right like the captain's log here's where we were here's where we are now here's where we're going and then oh crap, we veered way off course. How the hell did that happen? Oh, this is how it was because I was feeling this way or because I didn't pay attention to this. Do yeah. you, do you think that because you, you, of the, the fact you're so prolific with what you capture that that may have, that, that you need to journal and diarize because, Hey, listen, my mind isn't necessarily being a, a warehouse. It's now being, you know, a factory, which is what it really <laughs> is designed to do. I mean, that's a, that's an interesting way of, of putting it. I, I mean, I I've always felt like I had a really terrific memory for things that I read or things that I hear or things that I take in through media almost. Like I I can remember things I read, I can remember things I watch, I can remember things I listen to. I have a really bad memory for what happens to me, and I I can't figure out what that says about me. Maybe that just I've been distracted you know, from my life by all these uh, different forms of media that I love. But, um, I I don't know for sure what that means about me. I just know it works. Um, but I think that, you know, I just think the most poisonous thing about our modern moment right now is that everyone wants you to be somewhere other than where you are right now. Like if you think about, you know, where you're grounded in the world right now, like what you're, you know, where your feet are resting and what you're looking at in front of you and like what you're feeling and that place, literally everything in the world wants you to think about something else than that. You know, I mean, and it's in the interests of, the media companies to do that, you know, to pull you away from your own life into these other places and times. And, and of course, you know, sometimes we want to be somewhere else, you know, um, that's what art and literature and film and everything does for us. But I think the coolest thing that making art and making literature and making film can do is to, you know, kind of train you to pay more attention to where you are in the world. And I think that's what it also does for the reader or the viewer is that it trains them to really pay attention to their own lives. And um, I think we're losing some of that through just the endless stream of constant bombardment of media that we get now through Twitter and Facebook and all that stuff. You know, when, as I go through your work, not just this book and this book is full of this stuff, but when I go through your, your work, um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, reference to material that you've read that isn't from, you know, necessarily the modern moment, like blog posts or books that are recent, like we're looking at like Thoreau and even books that, you know, you're like, Oh, like, 
I forgot about that person or I never, or, or or I never even, I never even thought that this person could relate to necessarily to like Brian Eno. I know he's a creative, but it's like, he's a music, like there's, there's that connection that you've talked about earlier and you're able to connect those, those ideas, those thoughts to your work. Do you find yourself looking to the older texts, the older media, the older more and more for, to inform not only your work, but maybe the message you're trying to put out there, as opposed to say what we're seeing now. Uh, it, you know, I, I just, I, I'm seeing that more and more and it's, it's some of that stuff is just timeless and it's, it, it, if anything, we need that stuff now more than ever before. Yeah. I think if you're like a serious thinker or, you know, I don't think of myself as a very serious person, actually, I'm kind of more of a, I don't know how I think of myself, but it's not necessarily serious. But if you're a student of your craft and you're a student of writing and art um, and you're not going back as far as you can go, I mean, you're you're really hobbling yourself. I mean, there I, it sounds really, uh, you know, it's, this sounds absurd, but I'm not sure there's a lot of progress in art. I mean, I, I, as far as linear progress goes, um, I think that there are cycles, but I think that, you know, as human beings, we kind of circle the same things over and over. Um, and I just find for me personally, there's something about reading old texts that makes it just strange enough that you will do the work of relating what they're writing about to your own moment. So when you read Thoreau and he's like, I have given up reading the weekly newspaper because like, I just can't be two places at one time. (laughs) There's just something so like, you know, when I read him writing about that in his journal, it just, it makes such a greater impact than reading a blog post someone writes about how Twitter is just making them so upset, you know, because there's there's just this universal feeling when I go back in time with Thoreau where it's just like, here's a dude who, you know, 150 years ago, he was like, he was dealing with the same exact problem. It just wasn't so massive, you know, and then you kind of readjust yourself because you're like, okay, well, if a weekly newspaper was too much for Thoreau, maybe a weekly paper would be the perfect amount for me. You know what I mean? So, but there's, there's just something about like, I just think we're in a culture of the now and, you know, to, to divorce yourself from human history is it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a kind of malnourishment, you know, to, to not honor what came before you. Um, and of course there are always new problems, so there's always new writing to be done. But, um, uh, you know, the part of the joy for me of being a writer is to help people go back upstream, so to speak, like swim back upstream to find their way to other things that they might not have been passed down. As we get close to wrapping up, I want to share one piece from the book that I, you know, as I got close to the end. And again, anyone who's listening right now, uh, which is obviously the person listening right now, uh, you should be picking up this book because uh, there is so much great stuff in here. But this one particular, I mean, the blackout artwork at the end, I plant my garden because what else can I do but fool around with time? So I want to ask you, uh, how do you fool around with time? (laughs) Well, we're doing it, you know. (laughs) (laughs) We're doing it right now. We're fooling around with time. I mean, I think that... You know, time is the thing you get, and you don't know how much time you get and how you, how much time you're going to get. But I think time is exactly what we're up against, and it's exactly the, the real kind of currency that we get to spend in this life. And I think how you spend your time is, is you know, Annie Dillard, uh, she says, you know, how you spend your days is how you spend your life. You know, and so um, to not waste it, and if you're gonna waste it, to waste it deliciously. <laughs> you know, to really to waste it in the best way you can, um, I think is 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 the best thing you can do. But that's that's all we're doing. You know, we're just playing around with time, the time we get, and we're just filling the days, and hopefully you just fill them as well as you can. 
Austin, thanks for joining me today on the show. Of course, you can get Keep Going, 10 Ways to Stay Creative in Good Times and Bad on Amazon. Where else can people get it and where else can people learn more about you and your work, which they definitely should do? Well, I, I always encourage everyone to head to their local bookstore and check out a copy there. And if they don't have one, get it, have them order one. And you could also check out your local library, head in there. Um, and if you want to hang out with me, I'm at austincleon.com and uh, I have a daily blog and I put out a weekly newsletter. Austin, thanks again for joining me today on the Productivity is Podcast. This was fun. Thanks for having me. And there you have it. Uh, again, I was I would would have loved to continue to talk to Austin, but I know I want to be respectful of his time, respectful of yours. You can pick up his new book, Keep Going, as he mentioned, and uh, all the links will be uh, in the show notes. So if you're, you know, go check out the show notes as you're listening to this now and pick up the book. I'm a huge fan of his work. Subscribe to his newsletter, all that stuff. It, he, Austin is a real class act, and the goods he delivers time and time again are just full of quality. Uh Thanks to John Polster for producing the show, of course. Thanks to Connie for putting together the show notes. And again, I want to shine a bit of a, a spotlight. I don't get to do this very often on my own book, uh, the one that my last book, I'm working on another one right now, but the Productivity is Playbook is, is still available for sale. Uh, if you go to productivities.com slash playbook, you can get all of the details there. I mentioned them a little bit earlier in the episode. But remember that once I bring total time crafting from the beta phase into actual you know full launch mode this playbook will then go inside of the membership and it won't be available for sale outside of the membership so i encourage you to check it out productivityist.com slash playbook uh again you know it'll help you get from guessing to going and uh if you want to keep going then that's where austin's coming so i think that there's some some uh some definite correlation there so check it out again productivities.com slash playbook thanks for listening i really do appreciate it and i'd love it if you subscribe to the app uh, to the podcast if you like this episode and ratings and reviews are always helpful as well that's it for now i am your host mike vardy the host of the productivities podcast reminding you to stop guessing and keep going i'll see you later